Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third webinar in NEHA's Emerging Trends in Food Safety webinar series, Handling Food Safely in the Time of Third-Party Delivery. My name is Laura Wilde, and I am the Senior Program Analyst in Food Safety for the National Environmental Health Association. It's my pleasure to facilitate today's webinar. Please note this webinar is being recorded. If you are not okay with this being recorded, you may disconnect at this time. Thank you for joining us for our month-long observance of National Food Safety Education Month. We work to provide our members and the environmental health community at large educational resources and tools to promote to support the environmental health workforce. This month, we are hosting free webinars every Tuesday on emerging trends in food safety. Each webinar will be recorded and housed on our Food Safety Education Month page. NEHA credential holders can self-report one hour of continuing education for each webinar viewed via the self-reporting feature of My NEHA. We are also highlighting the outstanding work of our food safety professionals via our Food Safety Heroes blog. Food safety professionals across the United States and globally for that matter, work tirelessly to safeguard the food we eat. To recognize a food safety hero, please tell us about them and we'll shout their praises via our Food Safety Heroes blog. We'll put these links in the chat a little bit later for your convenience. This webinar is proudly hosted by the National Environmental Health Association. There are countless benefits to becoming an EHA member. You can connect with your peers, network, and get access to valuable resources and educational materials. We stand by our environmental health professionals who work so diligently toward the healthy environment for all. If you are not already a member of NEHA, check out our website at neha.org to learn more. A bit of housekeeping before we hear all about third-party delivery. All attendees are in listen-only mode. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. Throughout the discussion, you may submit the questions you have in the Q&A box. We will do our best to answer as many questions as time permits. I am pleased to introduce our speakers today. Let's learn a little bit about them before we dive in. Patrick Guzzel has been involved in retail food safety for almost 20 years. His career began as an environmental health specialist in Pocatello, Idaho. He later was hired as the Idaho Food Protection Program Manager. In 2018, Patrick started Mountain West Food Safety, LLC, and was the principal consultant. Patrick has been an active participant in the Conference for Food Protection, CFP, and has served on several committees, as well as chairing council too. He served as the chair of CFP from 2016 to 2018. He has received several recommendations for his collaborative efforts, uh, his collaborative effort, efforts with other organizations over the years, excuse me. Patrick is an active member of the Association of Food and Drug Officials and the National Environmental Health Association. He is an adjunct professor of public health at Boise State University. Patrick holds a Master of Public Health and a Master of Arts in Anthropology, both from Idaho State University, as well as a Bachelor of Arts in Spanish, also from Idaho State University. Patrick and his wife, Diane, both grew up in Colorado. She is uh, she in Littleton and he in Steamboat Springs. They have four children and reside in Boise, Idaho. Welcome, Patrick. Next, we have Taryn Laird. In their role as public health communications specialist at the National Environmental Health Association, Taryn Laird serves primarily as a communications leader in the Retail Food Safety Regulatory Association Collaborative. They maintain the collaborative's various communication channels and website, as well as provide support for other NEHA food safety initiatives, both internally and externally, including the new FDA, NEHA FDA Retail Flex Funding Model Grant Program, the NEARS Online Community, and the NEHA Food Safety Committee. And they participate on the Environmental Health and Equity Collaborative's Awareness and Communications Working Group. Taryn's background in the food service industry has given them a foundational knowledge in food safety, as well as real world experience. Taryn holds a, a Bachelor of Science in Human Nutrition and a Bachelor of the Arts in English from Metropolitan State University of Denver. Welcome, Taryn. And finally, we have Kate, uh, excuse me, finally, we have Katie Weston. As community engagement manager, Katie Weston develops outreach and 
engagement strategies and represents the partnership for food safety education to the health and food safety educator community. Katie has a bachelor's degree in elementary education and more than 10 years of experience working with nonprofit organizations. One of her greatest passions in life is strengthening and growing communities. She enjoys teaching ESOL, which is English for speakers of other languages in her spare time, and loves baking cupcakes and hanging out with her husband, Kevin, and sons, Will and Sam. I welcome all the speakers today. Thank you so much for joining us on this very important topic. At this time, I will pass it over to you, Patrick. The floor is yours. Thank you, Laura. I appreciate that. So we're going to be talking today about handling food safety with third-party delivery. There's some interesting dynamics that are taking place with third-party delivery across the country, and I'm sure that you're seeing them in your community as well. Next slide, please. We know from some household surveys that were conducted in the year 2020 that currently 53% of adults say that food delivery is essential to the way they live. That's a change. In, in dynamics, if you will. And I'll show you a couple of more statistics that I think are even a little more uh, revealing about the, the nature of third-party delivery. Next slide, please. So right now, from a 2021 State of the Industry report, we, we conduct in the, within the National Restaurant Association every year, a State of the Industry report. In 21, we heard that 60% of adults right now claim they're more likely to order food online or through delivery than they are to dine in. So we're approaching two thirds. Two thirds of the adult population are saying, I'd rather order online or have food delivered than I would dine in. Now, of course, a lot of that is because of the COVID pandemic that continues to uh, impact all of us. Next slide, please. I think this is the most revealing statistic from that same report. 64%, over two thirds of millennials say that food delivery is essential for them. So food delivery, third party delivery or direct from the restaurant, whatever you wanna, uh, however you want to, to envision that, it's here to stay and it's not gonna be going away. It is now, I think, part of our new normal, if you will. Next slide, please. So this presents some regulatory challenges. We'll first of all start with the concept or the, or the overall question of what constitutes a delivery vehicle. When I was in college, I worked for a national pizza chain, I'm not going to name which one. I was a delivery driver. I delivered pizzas. If I, if I worked, I mean, I was in college, so I would work sometimes four hours a day, sometimes only a couple hours a day. Sometimes on weekends, I would work eight hours a day. I was in my car for most of those hours delivering food around the community where I was attending college. So the question would become, would that car be considered a food establishment? How about a bicycle from or, or, or owned by a, a person who delivers food for some of the nationally known sandwich uh, restaurants? Would that constitute a delivery vehicle or even a food establishment. I know that hopefully most of us, especially if you're in the regulatory community right now, you're thinking, well, I'm not gonna go out and regulate a high school kid's car or a college student's car or a bicycle as a food establishment. However, note that the food code includes in their definition of food establishment, includes an operation that stores food. So how long is that storage valid for? could hypothetically, I suppose an argument could be made that that car that I drove in college met the definition of a food establishment. However, I'm gonna tell you right now, I would have been very hard pressed to meet any regulations at that time. I mean, that was, that was a long time ago. We had temperature control bags for the pizzas and that was about the extent of the food safety measures that we took uh, at, at that point in time. I'll talk a little bit later on about food safety measures that can be uh, undertaken now. So just kind of a regulatory a challenge, if you will. What, what constitutes uh, food establishment under this definition or when we look at that uh, delivery car or, or bicycle or other uh, whatever conveyance it is that's being used to deliver food, would that meet the definition of a food establishment? 
hopefully I, there's a lot of logistical concerns for uh, if we if we answer yes to that question, I think it just presents a lot of logistical concerns. Sorry about that. Next slide, please. So we recognize there is an increased need for training. The National Restaurant Association uh, worked closely with the National Environmental Health Association not too long ago to develop some training programs or at least some training outlines that could be used for providing some basic training for food safe or for, uh, for delivery operations. Now, I don't want to uh, steal any thunder when it is their turn. I know that Taryn is also going to show you some information from NEHA. So uh, they will go ahead and, and show that information when they have the floor. As we approach this question with, with NEHA and, and NRA together, we asked ourselves what training is really necessary for third-party delivery. And, and we did decide that, you know, it really just probably needs to cover the food safety basics because in conjunction with when NEHA, when, when NEHA and NRA was working on this, we also both uh, individually, we, we pulled in some subject matter experts who represent the third party delivery companies to help identify some of these same uh, questions. And so together, NEHA, NRA, the third party delivery companies, we, we worked on these programs and we, we just simply kind of tried to develop some very, some very basic food safety information. Next slide, please. We put these areas of focus uh, together and I'll go through them in a little more detail, primarily for the purpose of if you represent a regulatory entity and you have contemplated for your jurisdiction some kind of training program that should be in place for third party deliveries, we would encourage you to consider this kind of an outline. We say that because oftentimes these third party deliverers are not they don't meet the definition of a, of a food employee out of the food code. So they probably don't need the, the same depth and breadth of knowledge that, uh, that a food employee or certainly a person in charge would need. But again, we did uncover these four general topics, personal hygiene, temperature control, cross-contamination, and then we put in some general practices uh, that need to be addressed whenever we're talking about third party delivery. Now, as we put these, these materials together, and again, I think that you'll see this uh, from Taryn when they show you the, this, uh, the, the material that, that Neha developed. The intention here was we're doing this again for third party deliverers, not necessarily for a person in charge and certainly not for a food employee. Next slide, please. When we talked about personal hygiene for the NRA perspective, we identified this, these six subtopics, if you will, that needed to be addressed. Clean person, in other words, shower and bathe daily, right? Clean clothes. It's important that when you are delivering that you are wearing clean outer clothing to avoid cross-contamination issues. There's also a customer perception here that becomes very important. Now, we spoke frequently about the customer perception with the third-party delivery companies, and they agreed with us that that customer perception is very important. And so as we put these together, a lot of this has to do with not only the, the basic principles of food safety, but also related to what is going to be the customer's perception when they deliver that food. We speak about the, uh, the need to avoid eating, drinking, chewing gum, smoking, and use of other tobacco products while, they are, while an employee is actively delivering food. Of course, we all recognize the concern here for cross-contamination. We want to make sure that third-party deliverers who may not have a great deal of experience around food and food handling practices also are observing these same practices. We spoke about proper hand washing. This one proved a little bit challenging to us because oftentimes a person behind the wheel of their car or riding on the bicycle throughout the day, especially during the lunch rush, might not have easy access to an appropriate hand washing sink. So this one presented a little bit of a challenge to us. We went back and forth. We talked about, well, can that person find an appropriate hand washing sink? There were some logistical concerns with trying to do that. 
um, especially if the person is constantly busy delivering food. We did agree that when the person picks up a food order, they should have the opportunity to wash their hands in the kitchen of that food establishment before they deliver that food. Because of the logistical concerns that can be presented with proper and adequate hand washing at this point in time, we did decide to go ahead and emphasize the use of hand sanitizers. Now we did emphasize in our course that hand sanitizers only are really uh, effective after you have appropriately washed your hands. So we still are trying to emphasize that proper hand washing step. But again, keep in mind that these folks, ideally, I'll get to this information in another slide, under, the, under ideal circumstances, they are not having any contact with food. They are having contact with their, with their driving, their, their, their steering wheel and their gear shift and things like that. But otherwise they're not having any direct contact with food. Now we did place a heavy emphasis on working while sick and what specifically not working while you're sick. And what does that mean? What are the symptoms that we are concerned about? So in our course, we cover any kind of gastrointestinal distress symptoms, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. We talk about sore throat with fever as, as outlined in the food code. We included persistent coughing and sneezing in our classes recognizing that that may not be a direct food safety concern. There might be a seasonal allergy that's impacting a person's ability, uh, and, and that's why they're, they're sneezing or coughing frequently. However, again, there's a customer perception here. And think about yourself. If you have had food delivered to you over the course of the last year and a half, what goes through your mind if you see the delivery person approach your door and they're constantly coughing and sneezing, even though they might be perfectly in, in perfectly good health in other ways? So just some things to keep in mind for these third-party delivery organizations. Next slide, please. We spoke about temperature control. Now I want to draw your attention to the upper right corner of the screen here. Specifically, we want our our customers to understand, the customers using our course, to understand you have to keep the hot foods hot and the cold foods cold. We speak about using insulated delivery bags or possibly coolers. We recommend only one delivery per trip. I'll speak about cleaning delivery bags and coolers in another slide here. We recommend only, only one delivery per trip because we don't, we don't want to see that delivery take an extended period of time and have individuals out delivering food for you know, upwards of, of 30 minutes to an hour and possibly having some of those hot start to get cold and the cold start to increase in temperature. Again, customer perception involved there. Most importantly, though, is the lower left-hand area of the slide that's in front of you. We want to make sure, and we, we, we highly emphasize, and, and of course we support, that the delivery drivers, if they are driving a vehicle, they do so safely and efficiently. Under no circumstances do we advise people to break traffic laws or even bend traffic laws in any, under any circumstances that would not be acceptable. Next slide, please. When we talked about cross-contamination, there were a few things that we needed to make sure that folks understood. First of all, they cannot have any bare hand contact with food. Again, keep in mind, this is a third party deliverer. Anything that they contact should be like bags, outer wrappings of foods, things like that. Now, don't get me wrong, of course, there can still be a cross contamination concern. And that's why we wanted to emphasize hand washing in a prior part of our course. But we do wanna emphasize no bare hand contact with food at this point. We also heavily emphasized to not repackage food. This became a little bit of a concern because uh, some of the third party delivery companies felt that uh, it was their deliverer's uh, obligation to ensure the accuracy of the order before it got delivered. And if that becomes the case, we encourage third party deliverers to check the accuracy of the food within the kitchen of the restaurant before it ever leaves. And then when that package is sealed in the kitchen of the restaurant, that package is not opened until it's received by the consumer. And it is the consumer that actually opens that package. Additionally, we spoke about following instructions for any chemicals, especially when we talk about cleaning chemicals, sanitization chemicals. It is absolutely imperative that third-party deliverers 
recognize what those instructions are and how to use those chemicals appropriately. Next slide, please. We spoke about some general best practices. Again, don't open sealed containers. We spoke about limiting contact with high touch surfaces. That includes doorknobs. That includes elevator buttons. Um, maybe certain parts of your car. Uh, if, if you are driving a stick shift, you know, your, your hand is, if you're, if you're old enough like me, you know how to drive a stick shift, your hand is always on that, on that gear lever, right? And so you got to make sure that's a high touch surface, make sure that's clean and probably sanitized appropriately as well. We spoke about storing foods upright. Of course, we don't want foods to spill into each other. We don't want bags to turn over while you're turning a corner in a delivery vehicle. So it's important to store those foods upright. We spoke about keeping the vehicle clean. Along with that, we also spoke about regularly cleaning uh, delivery bags, especially insul insulated bags. Those are designed to be cleaned. A, a well-designed uh, insulated delivery bag is designed to be cleaned and sanitized occasionally, and it needs to go through that process. We spoke about don't transport unnecessary people. Now, this also presented some logistical concerns. Uh, I can tell you that uh, I have a family member who is a third-party deliverer for one of the, the major third-party delivery companies. And especially at night, uh, she will always bring her husband with her when she is delivering food. Uh, it's a safety thing for her. She doesn't ever want to find herself in a situation where she's alone delivering food to an unknown location and not knowing who she's delivering the food to. So as a safety precaution, she brings her husband with her whenever she can. We see that as, a, as probably a necessary person. An example of an unnecessary person in the car, for example, would be, uh, you know, don't take your kids to school at the same time you're trying to, to deliver foods. Uh, of course, don't have pets in the car while you're trying to deliver foods. We spoke about not storing automotive chemicals uh, in the car, especially where they can come into contact with food. Uh, oils, antifreezes, anything like that should not be stored in the car in a way that can present a contamination risk to the food. Next slide, please. So again, we focused our third party delivery course on those critical third party delivery scenarios. It's only a 12 minute course, it is interactive. It is optimized for mobile platforms. It can actually be completed in between deliveries, of course, provided that the person is not watching the course while they are actively driving. That would present a safety concern. And of course, we are adamantly opposed to putting themselves into a situation that would present a safety concern. Our course is available in both English and Spanish. It is available now. I believe it only costs $5 to go through our course. Uh, next slide, please. And that really concludes what I wanted to say about third party. Uh, if you have any questions at all, you are more than welcome to contact me. My email address is my first initial P, along with my last name, P Guzzle, at restaurant.org. I will be more than happy to answer any additional questions you might have. And I am now going to give the floor to Taryn. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Taryn Laird. I'm here to talk about the infographic Five Checks for Safe Food Delivery that was developed by the NEHA Food Safety Program Committee in the late spring of 2021. This infographic was developed as a direct response to the mon monumental rise in demand for third-party delivery that we saw over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic. But this change in consumer trends has been ongoing for several years with apps that make ordering food delivery more convenient, more broadly accessible, and driving the development of new food service concepts like ghost kitchens. Along with the rise in demand for these new services, we have seen some unique challenges in providing education to delivery persons. In 2020, the Conference for Food Protection released the guidance document for direct-to-consumer and third-party delivery service at food delivery. This document establishes the scientific and regulatory background pertaining to direct to consumer and third party delivery, as well as laying out guidelines and recommendations for maintaining food safety practices during food delivery. While the CFP document outlines recommendations for both direct to consumer and third party delivery, for this project we wanted to develop an easy to use tool that would be specifically tailored to third party delivery. 
The NEHA Food Safety Program Committee developed a subcommittee headed by Casey Gardner at the Virginia Department of Health and Chris Boyles at Sterotech. Our first step in developing this tool was reaching out to some of the major delivery services to determine their needs and how we might build a tool that best fit them. The industry representatives we met with shared that the best way for them to reach the delivery drivers was via their existing apps. This would allow the developers to translate material and for the services to integrate new food safety education in with their service model and pre-existing food safety education system. We knew from the beginning that we wanted to develop as, a, as accessible a product as possible. We wanted to focus on ensuring the readability of the product. We wanted it to be actional, actionable, to create something that would be able to work in multiple formats and that would focus on explaining the why. The NEHA Food Safety Program Committee combed through the CFP guidance document looking for overarching themes and large concept catch-all guidance or recommendations. We then focused on rewording these recommendations into simple, direct language. And as we worked on these recommendations, it became clear that there were five topic areas we could focus in on. Uh, this five also lended itself to a useful mnemonic using the image of a hand, which can also highlight the importance of hands when discussing food safety. Um, such as when you're talking about concepts like food package handling, personal hygiene, et cetera. To further enhance accessibility, we decided to include simple icons and demonstrate each uh, concept using very recognizable green check or red X images to indicate proper and improper food handling procedures. The resulting document contains very brief do and do not style recommendations and explains the why behind the various checks to help build capacity and further enhance food safety training offered by third-party delivery services. The full infographic is broken into five sections, each repeating the image of the hand and moving from the first steps or checks a driver might make, such as ensuring that they are feeling well and have clean hands and clothes, through the delivery process, including checking the vehicle for safety, ensuring food and beverages are properly stored and handled, and noting that time and temperature control is of utmost importance. <clears throat> However, we have also provided the infographic in two additional formats uh, to best meet the needs of our audience. First, we have broken the infographic into individual sections. This allows the users to focus in on more targeted information, providing specific reminders, or they might be able to more easily print the materials. And second, we provided all of the verbiage and images in the infographic to be downloaded from NEHA's website. This allows users such as app or web developers to integrate this information into their own systems as best suits their needs. We envision that this information might work well as pop-up reminders delivered to a worker's phone as they reach key points along the delivery route, such as opening the app to begin work for the day or arriving to and leaving from the restaurant. Some insights we gained while developing this infographic include um, that there is a desire to enhance food safety education for delivery persons, especially if that content can be included in pre-existing apps rather than as external content. Um, it can be challenging to explain food safety concepts in plain and accessible language. Sometimes the language used can't be as technically correct or scientific as we might be used to, um, but at the Food Safety Committee, we felt this was a really important uh, trade-off to make. And finally, we also learned that language such as delivery driver or car is not preferred. Um, as Patrick mentioned, many types of vehicles, including cars, bicycles, and scooters are used for food delivery. Um, so instead, we prefer to use language such as vehicle or delivery person. Um, and that's just a brief overview of the five checks for food safety infographic. As I said, the full infographic, as well as all of the other materials I demonstrated, are available for free on the NEHA website. Um, thank you very much for your time. We hope you will find this a useful resource for helping to spread awareness and educate about best practices for third party delivery. Um, and with that, I'll go ahead and hand the floor over to Katie Weston. Hi, I'm Katie Weston, and I'm here from the Partnership for Food Safety Education to share with you a new consumer-oriented campaign we have called Prep Yourself related to food delivery and also the research um, that we did in relation to creating that campaign. So next slide. 
So just really quickly, if you're not familiar with the partnership, it was formed um, following a jack in the box outbreak, I think in 1993, where several hundred people were infected and some children died. And so it was formed around the idea that home food safety was a really important part in the chain of prevention and that it mattered what people were doing at home related to food safety. And it was also formed with a commitment from partners um, in the industry and from federal liaisons to ensure that consumer food safety education would be shared with Americans when they're preparing food at home. And that regardless of where they got that information, whether it's from us or from the government or from those industry partners, it would be consistent and clear and very concise. Next slide. So I, I think um, Patrick and Taryn have both hit on this, um, but as we know, food delivery has really increased um, and all three types, groceries, meal kits, and food service. It was already beginning to grow, as you can see here in 2016 and through 2019, and then it quickly accelerated during the COVID pandemic. Next slide. Just This is just another indication of that. This is Google search data related to searches about food delivery. And you can see that in March, 2020, there was a drastic jump and that has continued to be high throughout the pandemic. And then our next slide should have a video if it will play um, that we'd like to share with you. So that video, by the way, is shareable. It's on our website and our YouTube. And next slide. <laughs> so because of this changing landscape related to food delivery that started even before the pandemic and is continuing to evolve and change, the partnership decided to begin looking into um, food safety education for consumers related to food delivery. And we began that in a November, December of 2019. We really saw two opportunities. One was to educate people who use food delivery about potential risk. And two is to leverage that as a new way to talk to them about food safety at home because they're using these apps and they're receiving all these packaging as they're getting things in their home. And that could be a new opportunity to get food safety messages to them in that very obvious handoff there. So next slide. So, as we started the development of this campaign, our goals were to raise awareness around home food safe handling for delivered foods in all three forms, whether that's grocery, prepared food, or meal kits, to encourage healthy food handling habits in households, and to build on the partnership's reputation with health educators, who we refer to as backfighters, 
food retailers and our industry partners. Next slide. I'm not going to read all these bullet points, but this is just an outline of the process that we took. We started in 2019 and we started a dialogue within our partnership, which is roughly 40 organizations plus, plus federal liaisons from USDA, FDA, and CDC. We did some consumer um, surveys in 2020. We did some research with Iowa State University. And we also hired a firm called Wild Hive to do work on a creative platform for us. Next slide. So again, you know, this is the process that was laid out. I kind of just went over it, but February, March, we did our strategic planning. March and June, we worked on our messaging and creative testing. June and July, we began our communication strategy. Um, in July and August, we began to develop a microsite and some print and digital content, as well as media materials. And then we launched this campaign just in August, uh, on August 25th, just a few weeks ago. Next slide. So as part of this process, we did have partners um, who are directly involved in food delivery that helped give us input. So I do want to mention them, FMI, HelloFresh, Instacart, Cisco, Walmart, and Uber, Uber Eats all took part in conversations, as well as, again, the FDA, USDA, and CDC. Next slide. So we did five um five points of research related to this the first was an iowa state university survey and then we did a review of observational data related to food safety behavior including the usda's observational data and then three rounds of consumer testing for our messaging and what i'm going to do next is just go i'm going to go really super quickly through all of that research for you um, if i go too fast I, my understanding is both the slides and a PDF I have of the Iowa State research will be available for you afterwards on Neha's website, or you're welcome to reach out to me directly. Next slide. So again, we began with this Iowa State University survey. Um, that was conducted in the summer of 2020. And this was to begin to identify user profiles for who was using delivery services. And we also asked some um, self-reporting on food handling behaviors at home. And again, there's a PDF of this research that I think is going in the chats now, or again, will be available on our website and on Neha's website afterwards. Um, so next slide. We asked them, one of the key things we asked was about delivery service frequency and those three, the three different colored bars, that's because we broke it into pre prepared food, meal kits, and groceries. Um, so we asked them how often they were receiving that. Next slide. We also asked, how long do you wait to put perishable items away? And we asked that again individually for each of the types of delivery, um, meal kits, prepared food or groceries. Next slide. We asked how long do you keep leftover food and then eat it? Um, this of course again was very interesting I'm, and I'm just going through them quickly but you will be able to see that later in the PDF. Next slide. Now this was particularly interesting. We did ask them to self-report how often they were washing their hands before handling food. 98% said that they did. But as we know from the USDA's observational research, not everyone is necessarily washing their hands correctly with soap and water and scrubbing for 20 seconds. And on the next slide, you'll see a little bit of that. We asked, 
them, how do you wash your hands? And got some interesting responses, particularly that with water. We think it was that low because people assumed everyone washes their hands with water. But again, we know not everyone is washing their hands with soap or for 20 seconds or scrubbing. So next slide. Through this survey with Iowa State Research, we discovered that there was a key group that used all three types of um, food delivery, and that was males ages 35 to 54, either urban or suburban, and with a household income of over 60,000. So as we developed this campaign, we did keep that key group in mind as we developed the campaign, that that was kind of our core audience that we were going to focus on. Next slide. So the second part of our research was to go through the existing data that's out there, again, from the USDA observational research. Um, and what we gathered from that was that there were some vulnerabilities um, with food safety related to food delivery around hand washing, properly temping foods, and cleaning and sanitizing countertops before or after meal preparation. And I won't read the statistics, but you can see them there. Next slide. And then finally, we had three rounds of creative research. Um, and this, this point in time was when we began working with Wild Hive as we gathered the research and tested out different logos and designs and messaging. And so I will, I will go through those three parts again quickly. Next slide. So our first um, survey was a 10 question survey to help us understand how Americans perceive issues around food safety and also what might motivate them in making decisions that could change their behavior. Next slide. And what we found was the most influential decision making factor for this group that we surveyed was having a responsibility or a sense of responsibility for the health and safety of loved ones. That was really the most important factor for them. Next slide. We also found that the sources they felt they could trust that were most credible were subject matter experts. And then a second would be a close family member. Next slide. Some other things that emerged from that survey were that hearing stories about people or places like them was influential, and that um, long-term health and reducing food waste were both important values to this group. Next slide. So again, summarizing some key takeaways of what we knew at this point, um, that family and healthcare and research institutions were influential. Statistics mattered if they were tied to something personal or local, like a story. Um, again, relatable case studies and stories matter. It wasn't clear if financial benefits of proper food safety habits were motivators, that didn't seem clear and that people wanted to be seen as protecting their family and friends. And that was really one of the most important things to them. Next slide. So in June, 2021, we began to start testing specific headlines and themes with an audience of people that was already using food delivery. Um, and we tried out initially seven different combinations of headlines and themes and two different taglines. Next slide. Initially, the winning tagline was prep yourself, wash hands, wipe down. That seemed to be the favorite headline, although I, you may have noticed that's not what we landed on. Next slide. Um, 
so in the next stage of research, we began to test the messaging and logo and get a little deeper into how the audience was viewing that message of washing up hands and counters. Um, and we had identified those as two important vulnerabilities. So that's why the focus was on hand washing and cleaning and sanitizing counters. So we began to kind of test what those messages meant to people. So next slide. We did get some good um, results from that. 38% were curious, 42% felt it would motivate them to wash hands, 78% felt it was positive, um, and 65% liked this specific message of prep yourself, wash up hands and counters. Next slide. However, as we were testing the message, we got a little concerned with this top statistic on the slide that 46% believed wash your counters meant wiping off counters with a disinfectant wipe. Um, and we were concerned because that's not the message that, um, that's not a fundamental message for home food safety. Rather, counters should be washed with soap and water. So we started to reconsider the logo. Next slide. And we ended up doing another test after some input from our government agency partners and um, some other expert partners. And we landed on prep yourself, food is on the way. And as you'll see in the next slide, that was our final logo. And these are all the, it's available in a lot of different um, colors and styles here. But that went through a final round of testing, again, with input from the federal liaisons and our partners, and that became our um, logo for this campaign. Prep yourself, food is on the way. So next slide. So the campaign itself is a multi-pronged strategy, and we developed it to um, really rely on and require collaboration to move forward. There's a microsite as part of the campaign that's intended to be a one-stop shop on consumer resources and information about safety, uh, safely handling food delivery. And it also has some guidance for food safety at home. And it has materials for anyone that talks to consumers about food safety related to food delivery. So there's resources that can be shared as well on the microsite. But we also saw this new campaign as a way to begin cultivating stories from real people about the long-term effects of contracting a foodborne illness. We know that people respond really well to stories, and we saw that again in our research. And so what part of the collaboration of this campaign is looking to other people like yourself to help us cultivate these stories that can be shared with the media and with consumers to help really stress the importance of practicing safe food handling. We also um, intend to engage food delivery companies and other experts um, as part of this campaign and traditional media and social media. So next slide. So the microsite is at fightback.org slash prep dash yourself. We did a press release on it in August 30th. Sorry, my throat is scratchy. I'm drinking a little water. <coughs> so, we will continue promoting this Prep Yourself campaign throughout National Food Safety Education Month. Um, and we're looking for the engagement of experts and food delivery companies with this campaign. We want to leverage the food safety stories that we're gathering with media, and we'll be doing some digital advertising. Next slide. So, as well as the microsite, there's a toolkit available there that has resources that can be used this month, but also beyond this month. There's content, including graphics and um, language that can be used in social media, resources, print materials too, that can be used with consumers. 
And you can use this all, I mean, you're also, we would encourage you to share this with other experts in the community that might talk with consumers or share information with consumers. There's even information that can be used during a media interview if you wanna talk about the topic of food delivery related to food safety. And we're also really calling for your help in identifying food safety stories that could connect consumers with the risks related to food safety. So, you know, one way if you, I should share, if you have um, a story that you'd like to share with us, you can always email me at kweston, kweston at fightback.org or info at fightback.org. We also really want your feedback as we're going forward with this campaign on what is working, what else would you like to see, what other resources would be useful in this campaign, um, perhaps materials in other languages. We wanna hear from you about that. So please reach out to us and let us know. Next slide. So the, the toolkit of materials includes flyers, bag tags, the receipt images, the logo that you saw earlier. There is a comprehensive brand and logo guide that helps you um, see how you can use the different assets in various ways and the best practices for doing that. Next slide. There's also digital ads and social media content, and all of this is available on the microsite. I do wanna mention that when you go to the microsite to get the materials, there's a form that you'll have to fill out. We are asking um, you to do this because we wanna document how our materials are being used and also be able to follow up with you to continue improving and developing the campaign. But information will not be released we do not give out personal information. It would stay within the partnership. Next slide. So again, as you're, as you're continuing to use this, uh, these resources, we hope that you will. We hope you'll share on social media or download the toolkit or take a look at the microsite. We'd also like you to stay in touch with us. If you'd like to sign up for our mailing list, we email every other week. Um, food safety resources, free educational events that we offer like webinars and stories of backfighters out in the field and what they're doing. And you can do that at fightback.org slash sign up. And next slide. Then one final thing I'd like to mention really quickly, this Saturday for National Food Safety Education Month, we are hosting a fundraising event. Um, the the donations that the partnership receives are what helps us um, be able to offer things like free webinars and the free campaign resources like Prep Yourself or Clean, Cook, Separate, Chill. But this is also a really, really fun event. We have Cole and Clayton and their grandma Barb here to cook with us um, one of their award-winning recipes from a recipe contest that we just held. And so the kids will be showing you how to cook the food. If you can't attend live, you can still sign up and the recording will be made available afterwards. And there are also prizes. Even if you can't make it live, I think you can keep getting prizes until September 25th. So if you watch the recording within that week, you would still be eligible for prizes. So I would encourage you to sign up and join us for that. It will be really fun. And you can do that at fightback.org slash events. And next slide, which I think is my final slide. I just, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the partners that helped us make this campaign possible. Afto, Instacart, Cisco, and Uber Technologies who did the underwriting for our initial food delivery task force. So I just wanna mention them and say thank you to them. And that's it. Great, thank you so much, Katie. And, and thank you, Patrick and Taryn. What an interesting um, way to share how you're getting information and putting it in formats for your audience and um, getting it to them in forms that they can use. I just think that's a really wonderful, um, a wonderful thing that, that each organization is doing. So thank you so much for, for your presentations today. We do have some time for questions and I'd like to give the audience an opportunity to ask any questions they might 
have uh, using the Q&A box. We did have one come in a little bit earlier and I wanted to make sure that it got um, addressed. So the question is, um, foodborne illness is a, is, some, is a concern for delivery vehicles. What processes and procedures are in place to investigate outbreaks that occur from delivery vehicles? And what might be some of those challenges and, and legal implications? So I think I'll give that question to Patrick. Did you want to add anything to the response that you put in the chat? Yeah, I did put a little bit of a chat in there. I, I happen to see this question. I know it comes from my friend James Mack. James, good to see you. I'll put the word C there in, uh, in the air quotations there. Uh, it's a great question. And yeah, of course, there are concerns for this. I don't know the exact answer to some of the specifics of the question that you asked as far as uh, legal ramifications and legal liabilities. I will say that there is a CFP committee that just got formed with this last CFP that is investigating barriers to regulatory authorities to conduct a full foodborne illness. And I speculate that this might uh, become a question with that committee as far as what kind of barriers might exist for third party deliveries and in investigating foodborne illness. So the best answer I can give you right now is kind of a stay tuned. Uh, we might have some better information uh, in a couple of years for you. Thanks, Patrick. And it's, it's nice to hear CFP is working on issues like that, uh, it's particularly, um, you know, when we have emerging issues that come up, it's a really great platform for us to kind of uh, dive into some of the issues. So thanks for that. I see another question here. Um, let's see. What about encouraging people to test the temperature of cold food that's delivered to the home? Uh, so maybe Katie, this one, could be directed to you. Haven't studies shown problems with cold foods being delivered at temperatures that are not cold? And, and you know, what would we advise consumers to do when they receive food like this? Yeah, I don't know if I mentioned that in the slide, but if, if you visit the microsite, one of the key messaging, um, one of the key messages that we're giving people is that if they have food delivered, it needs to be used or refrigerated immediately. Um, and we do mention that um, the temperature that a refrigerator should be kept at to keep food um, cold enough to be safe. So yeah, I'm, that's a very good point. I don't know that we encourage people to temp the cold food, but again, we are encouraging them to put it in the refrigerator immediately or immediately after they're receiving it. Thank you. And it looks like we might have time for one more question before we do a wrap up. And I'll, I'll ask this question of Taryn. Taryn, you mentioned that the Food Safety Committee at NEHA developed a, the application to be used in different ways. If a company that is in third-party delivery wants to use this, what would you suggest they do? Is there someone they could reach out to at NEHA to get a little bit more information? Or is everything on that website that we shared a little bit earlier? Um, thanks, Laura. We did try to make the website a pretty comprehensive resource, um, but we are very willing to work with anyone who might need the information in a different format um, or any other needs that they might have. I certainly encourage people to reach out directly to me. Uh, my email can be found multiple times throughout the slide or it's tlaird, L-A-I-R-D at neha.org. Great, thanks, Taryn. And uh, I know we have another question in the chat, but we are winding down and I wanna be respectful of everybody's time, but I'll be pleased to answer that question using the, the panelist connections that we have here. So we'll send out that um, in a follow-up email. So uh, before we go, I do want to mention that we do have another webinar coming up next week for National Food Safety Education Month. Um, it uh, is advancing food safety with emerging technologies. We have a couple of speakers going to be talking about um, how they're using technology to promote food safety practices. So I do hope you join us next week, uh, Tuesday the 7th from 2 to 3. Thank you both to Patrick, uh, not both, but thank you all to Patrick, Taryn, and Katie for your time, your valuable insights on today's webinar. And of course, thank you all the, to all the attendees that came today um, to support us and to see what we're doing and see each of our organization's successes. So we're, we're very pleased to support the environmental health community 
And um, thank you all for being on the webinar today. Don't forget to nominate your Food Safety Hero in our Food Safety Heroes blog, and we'll be seeing you next week. Thanks again. Take care.